right, let's go ahead and jump in. Welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amanda Dyer, the co-director and producer of the documentary Unseen, How We're Failing Parent Caregivers and Why It Matters. The film explores the challenges faced by many parents who are caring for children with disabilities or complex medical needs, which is estimated to be at least 16.8 million people in the United States. Um, so we're excited that November is National Family Caregivers Month, and we are hosting a um, virtual screening event in honor of that. So you can watch the film on demand from November 18th through 30th. If you'd like to join, you can get your tickets and info at caregiverdoc.com slash November. And if you're watching at a later date, we also are adding new screenings all the time. So if you go to our website, caregiverdoc.com slash watch, you can see screenings that are coming up, some in person, some virtual. So you can always check that out there. And then in addition to uh, sharing the film in honor of Caregivers Month, we're also doing a series of webinars and panels, which you are a part of today. Um, and we're gonna be discussing possible solutions to some of the challenges that are presented in the film. So today we are discussing um, one of those possible solutions, um, kind of a DIY approach to long-term residential care. And we are joined by Jess Ronnie. I think let's get you popped up here. There you are. Jess, yes, this is the Jess Ronnie from the documentary. You probably recognize her if you've seen it or been following her online. Um, Jess wears a lot of different hats. Um, so I will let you do your, do your own introduction, Jess, so we make sure and cover everything. Well, thanks for having me, Amanda. And hello, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Jess Ronnie. I'm featured in the documentary. Um, I'm also an author a speaker, podcast host at Coffee with Caregivers and founder of the Lucas Project. Um, and I have eight children. I think that about covers it. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, awesome. Yeah, we're so excited to have you. And um, if you all have questions while we're on here, we're gonna try to cover a lot of the big items that I know people are curious about. But if you have specific questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat and we will try to get to them either during if it makes sense or, or at the end as well. All right, okay, let's dive in. All right, first of all, people always ask me, what's up with the Ronnies since we finished filming the documentary? So it hasn't been that long, only a couple months, but we do get that question a lot. So give us the update, what, what's going on at the Ronnie household? Well, the Ronnies moved into their new home finally um, in April, I believe. Um, after building it for about a year and a half, we built an accessible home for Lucas and just a home that we felt would be comfortable for our large family. Um, and what else are we doing? I finished book number three. That was exciting. Um, created a study guide to go along with that and just hard at work with the Lucas Project. Um, we purchased Hope Farm, which I know that we're going to be diving into what all of that looks like as well. And the kids are good. Um, Ryan and I kind of joke lately, Luke has become one of the easier children with six teenagers <laughs> in our house right now. So as you can imagine, wow. that's that's a lot. That's a lot of big feelings going on. <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> cool. Thanks for that. Um, all right. So give us kind of the, the background. You mentioned Hope Farm. That's the residential solution that you're coming up with, how you, you're calling it. Um, so take us a little bit back in time. How did you get to even having something called Hope Farm? Where, where did this kind of originate from? Um, well, as you're aware, I've been kind of talking about this for the past couple of years, and I would even say all through the filming of the documentary, I had this dream of creating this farm for Luke, and maybe it wasn't even creating this farm, it was finding a farm, um, like a residential farm community. Um, and when we moved to Holland, Michigan, uh, when did we move here? About a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, there is this beautiful farm community called Benjamin's Hope. And it's five minutes away from our house. And um, I have a tendency to sort of get ahead of myself. And I was like, oh, it's meant to be. You know, we built a house five minutes away from Benjamin's Hope. And Luke's going to live at Benjamin's Hope. And we're all going to ride bikes down to Benjamin's Hope. And it's going to be perfect. Um, well, come to find out, Benjamin's Hope doesn't have any spots available. And not only Benjamin's Hope, nowhere in Michigan has a spot available unless you 
become absolutely desperate. And what that basically looks like is like you or your spouse has to die or have a terminal illness, and then you're bumped to the top of the list. But as we met with community mental health, they said the average wait time is about 10 to 15 years to get your loved one into any sort of residential spot. And that could be five hours away up in the UP um, when you finally get to that point. And my husband and I were just like, yeah, that's not okay. Um, And not only is that not okay in terms of like losing all sense of control over where your loved one ends up, it's not okay that Luke now has to wait 15 to 20 years and might possibly have a spot available when he's 40 years old and he'll only have that spot available because something horrific has occurred to either me or his dad. So then he has to go through the trauma of losing a caregiver and moving five hours away, away from everything he's ever known and loved. So I called up my realtor friend and just said, could you just start a search with these criteria? Um, we, we knew it had to be affordable and I just wanted to see what was out there. Didn't have a whole lot of faith that we were going to find much in this West Michigan market because it was so hot for so long and everything was just going within hours. Mm -hmm. Um, But she set up a search and I would just kind of look at it occasionally. And then one day in um, the end of July, uh, this farm, this very interesting property came up for sale and it had two houses on it and a barn and a bunch of outbuildings. Um, And the township was not allowing anybody to split it and they were not allowing any developer to develop it. So the one house was a 150 year old farmhouse and the other house was a sprawling ranch and then this big white barn with a bunch of outbuildings. And I knew I wanted kind of a day program respite center on this mini farm as well. And I thought, I'm just gonna run over here and check it out. Um, So I went over, checked it out and my realtor met me over there and I was like, this is it. And we did have the financial backing from an anonymous investor who saw the film offered to front the money on a short-term loan if we were to find something so that we could jump on it quickly. But we do have to have our own plan in place within three years to either refinance it or pay it off. So I think that's kind of the Cliff Notes version of how (laughs) Hope Farm came about. Um, So then, yeah, we put an offer on it. Well, I I saw it. I brought Ryan to see it the next day. And I thought for sure that he was going to be the dream killer because he's the much more practical one where I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And he was like, no, I think this is it. Um, And we've always kind of operated in faith and we both felt a piece about it. um, And we put an offer on it and nobody countered it. Nobody um, else even put an offer on it. And we got it the following day. So it just well, felt like a God thing at that point. Yeah, that's so awesome. Yeah, it's so cool that it's like it feels almost custom design for mm-hmm. what you're what you're looking for. Cool. Um, so, did you have who at the beginning? Who's kind of in, did you have any help uh, professionals advising you along the process? Or you know, you said the realtor was anybody else kind of involved behind the scenes for how to approach this? Um. My motto is kind of throw, throw darts at a board and, you know, hope they stick. So I will, I just asked, I asked and asked and asked people to help me. I would go on social media and say, we need an attorney. Are there any attorneys who would be willing to offer um, some free legal advice? And I got an attorney and then we put, put a call out for an architect and then we got a free architect. And then Um, Just working closely with community mental health in our area, I just set up numerous meetings and just pick their brains. And then Benjamin's Hope, the place that I mentioned in the the beginning, I um, wrote their executive director, the mom who started this big, beautiful farm facility for her son, Benjamin. And I just said, could I buy you lunch so I can pick your brain? And she said, sure. So just reaching out to people and asking. And I would say 95% of people have said yes. Um, they're very willing to help and they're very willing to even give of their, their time and their um, expertise if you reach out and just ask. Um, and I guess you just can't be afraid of no because you might get mm-hmm. that every once in a while, but you'll get a whole heck of a lot of yeses too. And you said you'd talk to community mental health. Is that like a, a state agency or what is that exactly? 
Yes. And I guess that's how Michigan does it. And every state is different is what I'm learning. Um, when we lived in Tennessee, all of the scripts and all of the services tended to go through the, the primary doctor. Um, but when we moved to Michigan, they have this organization called Community Mental Health. And when a child or an individual turns 18 and enters adult services, um, most of the time they are automatically transferred over to Medicaid. And then therefore you start working with community mental health for all of your services and support. So they're the gatekeepers for um, all of the residential care. They're the ones where a family calls them and they say, look, my, my wife just died. I cannot take care of my disabled child anymore. I need a placement. Um, they're the ones who dole out the respite funds or the community living support money. Like they are the keepers of everything having to do with the Medicaid funding here in Michigan. Okay. So in theory, probably every state has an organization that or I'm agency assuming, doing the same thing. Yes, something similar. I'm not entirely sure how it works in different states. Okay. Because it so, could have been different even transferring from when he was a child in Tennessee to then an adult in Michigan. So that could be different. Okay. Yeah, so I guess the point is there's probably some agency that is kind of managing this in your mm -hmm. state that would be a good place to check in with first, to kind of figure right. out how they approach it. Um, so do you have do you have the home set up as like is it something official like it's registered with the state as a residential facility like legally or how, how is it structured in that sense? We really wanted it to be unlicensed, but we can't have more than four individuals um, to keep it unlicensed. Um, you retain a lot of the control and what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. Um, but it's such a big home and we felt like at the end of the day, it would be such a waste of space. And to be able to serve at least six families, we thought, okay, let's just get it licensed. The funding is better with licensing as well because you have more um, oversight over the whole property. So how we're doing it is my husband and I are just the landlords of the home. We are contracting with a home health care agency who will carry the license. So the home health care agency will provide everything having to do with care. We will simply be the landlords. So the six individuals who live there will pay us their social security checks as their rent, their room and board. Um, and that'll cover utilities, you know, maintenance and upkeep and rent. And then the home health care agency will get Medicaid funding through community mental health to provide the care for the individuals. Um, that's just not something I had the have the bandwidth for or ever want to have the bandwidth for um, finding and retaining direct care staff and just all the administrative overhead and it's just not something I want to deal with and we got lucky my mm -hmm. sister-in-law is actually starting a home health care agency to work strictly in correlation with our properties but if you were to do this you would just contract with an existing home health care agency to provide the care mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what, so you said the, the licensing versus unlicensed, if you're unlicensed, there was a, there's a limit of how many people can live in one. That was kind of the, the main reason to get licensed. It was, and the funding is significantly better um, oh, okay. for the care aspect. Um, and actually for the social security aspect, if you're licensed, um, you get like 900 per individual. If you're unlicensed, it's 700. Um, and that wasn't a huge determining factor, but the funding for the care was a huge determining factor because we want the best care that we can possibly get. And yeah. we want to be able to provide them a sustainable wage where they want to stay and we're not having like care overturning Turnover. all the time. Right. So mm -hmm. that was, um, but it is interesting in this one ranch, if we're not licensed, we can serve four individuals in this huge sprawling ranch. If we are licensed, we can serve up to 12. <laughs> so it's oh wow we don't want to we just we we want to cap it at six we feel like that's a really good number but it is interesting like if you get licensed they're happy to jam them in there and I, I cannot imagine <laughs> that that house would you know comfortably hold, serve, comfortably yeah. hold 12 individuals yeah. but yeah who knows and license means like there's 
inspections and mm -hmm. different guidelines and things that you have to be compliant with, I assume. Yep, but we don't have yeah. to be ADA compliant if we don't have anybody in a wheelchair. Um, we were told that it would be in our best interest to be ADA compliant just because in the future we could then serve an individual in a wheelchair, but they said mm -hmm. you don't have to be ADA compliant. Okay. Um, and can you, I'm sure people are curious too, just like the financing side of it. Um, so you said you had the um, investor that was compelled by the story that um, was willing to kind of help you get the short term loan, but are you, you, I think you've mentioned before you're doing grants, individual donors, what's kind of the big picture plan to actually cover the property? I'm sure, you know, that'd be my first question is how do we pay for this? How do we pay for a property to make this happen at? Well, Amanda, you know, I operate very differently than you <laughs> jump in, whereas you have your spreadsheet. <laughs> we started a GoFundMe page and we've been able to raise $10,000 through that. Um, and then as we solidify the residents who will be living in this home, we have asked for a 5,000 donation from each of the families just to be able to go in and start some of the renovation process. Um, and the families haven't had any um, problem in, in helping in that way. Um, and then we're committed to just do the rest. Uh, we'll either fundraise for the house or um, my husband, my husband and I will just pay for the remaining re renovations because we do recognize that it is our asset. Um, and once we do, we get the social security checks coming in, that will be our income. So we recognize that we need to improve our asset and we're just treating it like another rental property. Um, my husband already has rental properties. So this is a familiar road for us. And our goal is if this model works, we want to transform more of our rental properties into housing for disabled individuals. And we also wanna go and teach other investors and landlords how to do the same and say to them, hey, with just a few modifications to your home, you could collect this amount of money if you would just serve this population. So it almost makes sense from a financial mm -hmm. standpoint to make a couple of those modifications. And then we have so much more housing available for the disabled population. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's just kind of how things get done in America is if there's mm -hmm. a financial incentive, that's what, you know, gets people interested right. in, in doing it. So if you can figure out what that model is and maybe we can start cracking away at some of the the shortage of just available and properties that's exactly why we did an llc instead of working it through the nonprofit because we want it to be a sustainable model that we can teach other people how to replicate because that's the only way that we solve this housing crisis like you said there has to be a financial incentive and if it makes sense to investors and landlords they'll do it mm-hmm yeah. And it sounds like a big help too has been how you've gotten other families to kind of be like the founding members. Yes. Um, to just have them on board early on. Yeah, that has been. Um, and as we move forward, we have three of the roommates solidified. So four of the individuals are set in stone. Um, and that process has been a learning curve for me, definitely. Um, just in trying to determine, we have four individuals who are very, very vulnerable and high personal care needs. So we've had to be careful about who will be in the home just in terms of behavioral needs because we can't put these four individuals in harm's way. Um, so that's been hard um, just in even having to say no to some people because I hate that. I absolutely mm -hmm. hate this power dynamic almost that I have over a family who is desperate for a solution. Um, but we just, cause you understand that you've been there. I do. Yeah. I understand yeah. it 100%, but we can't jeopardize those four individuals and what they need. So that has been heartbreaking. Um, and unfortunately has taught me to kind of put a barrier almost between that process. Whereas before, I was becoming like best friends with everybody initially and just, yeah, of course we can serve your family. Um, but it was a hard lesson to learn, but mm -hmm. one that I needed to learn for sure. Yeah, that's so hard. You want, you want to help everybody, but mm -hmm. there's just, you know, it just can't work that way. Right. Um, and yeah, that, I think that kind of leads into, you start, you um, kind of talked about earlier, the 
uh, like personal care needs versus behavioral care needs. You've, I think you've learned like there's kind of two different tracks that you have to choose from. What, is, what mm -hmm. does that look like? Um, well, in the beginning, like I mentioned, I reached out to some women who had created something similar uh, here in West Michigan for their children, um, specifically three women. And they all agreed to either meet with me or have a Zoom meeting or a, a conversation on the phone. And all three of them said, you kind of have to pick your lane. It either has to be high personal care needs or high behavioral needs, because if you're serving both populations, you're uh, direct care staff are going to get burned out very quickly. Um, and you're going to have an immense amount of turnover because that's too much to put on those individuals. So because Lucas is primarily high personal care needs, um, needs assistance and maneuvering and feeding and bathing and diapering. And we decided to go with that model. Um, but that's where um, we did have a couple of families reach out interested with high behavioral needs and just recognizing that these four vulnerable individuals that we did say yes to couldn't have that kind of aggression or behavioral needs within the home without jeopardizing their safety. Mm -hmm. Okay, so family might need to decide kind of which, mm -hmm. depending on their individual situation, which track sort of makes sense. For right. Them. Okay, and that's primarily a uh, well, safety and care, a, a worker retention yes. consideration. Um, what about um, where do you think is the best place to start? Like, if a family is looking to do something, I, I, I can imagine it feels very overwhelming. You know, your child's getting older, you're trying to think about long term. What's the first thing you even do if if this sounds like something you might want to pursue? A um, couple of things. I think you would contact the equivalent of your community health organization, community mental health organization, wherever you live, and just say, what would be the steps? Because they are going to have um, very concrete steps that you have to take in order to create something like this um, and, for, and for you to get the care um, through the Medicaid dollars that you're going to need to create something like this. Um, basically, anybody can turn a home into a rental property for disabled individuals. And if they're already receiving Medicaid services, um, it just depends on, again, what the licensing restrictions are in your state. Here in Michigan, if we only wanted to serve three or four individuals and have an unlicensed home, that would be a much easier process. Um, so I would reach out to the equivalent of the community mental health organization. I would reach out to somebody who's done it and just pick their brain, take them out for lunch or coffee or ask for a phone call and just say, tell me how you did it. <laughs> what, what do I need mm -hmm. to do in this area to make this happen? Um, and then I, I would say to, to get some other families involved because as these families are coming on board with Hope Farm, I feel like we are kind of marching forward as a community now. And my husband and I will often say how wonderful and beautiful it is that I think we have found and will continue to find our community at Hope Farm because we're all in this for our kids. Um, we're all like just trying to create this beautiful space where they can live and grow and learn together. And I think for us, what we envision is even the families coming together like once a month and you know doing potlucks and making it a community event where we're, we all really care about each other's um, adult children and, you know, we were looking out for one another. So finding a couple of families to do it with um, would definitely mm -hmm. release some of that burden of having to carry it all on your own shoulders. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. That makes anything feel so much more approachable if you have someone beside you. Right. Um, so let, let's go back to um, Hope Farm specifically for a little bit. Um, so tell us kind of what's your vision or like how long what's the timeline because I think you said it's going to need some renovations and things how are you kind of structuring that and balancing the upgrades needed with money coming in to do that um well we just about have the funding for the first phase of the home so we're kind of projecting that we're going to start the renovations on the first floor in January um, and that will probably take a couple of months. And then once we have that finished, we can move the four 
initial residents in, which we're kind of projecting will be next summer. Um, I don't think any of us are in a huge hurry because it is a really scary endeavor after, you know, taking care of your child for his or her entire yeah. life. And like, I can't even really bring myself to imagine that moment of bringing him there and dropping him off <laughs> and saying goodbye. And, and I think it'll be the same for all of the family. So we're just taking it very slowly. Um, and then once that first floor is finished, we've seen too, as we post that things are moving forward and getting completed, that the funding continues to come in. So that's been a really good way just to, I think, raise some more money. So I think once we have that first floor completed and we have volunteers ready to go for all of the work, so it's just product that we're going to need to purchase, um, we'll move on to the second floor. And then in terms of the the resident, or the, I'm sorry, the respite center slash day program. We're just going to start on that when, when we have the money. Um, and that will be operated through the Lucas project as part of the nonprofit um, and part of our mission statement to provide respite for families. And so I can apply for some grants from foundations. I have a few pitches coming up in November and um, I, yeah, we'll start that when we have the funding. Um, but we're not in a huge hurry for that either at this point. Okay. So yeah, really taking just kind of like a step-by-step, -step, do what you can mm -hmm. as you move along. Yeah. Um, what else is there any, anything else that you think is important about the process that we didn't cover? Um, I don't think so. What about, is anybody have any, if you have any questions and you want to pop them in the chat, we should have some time to get to those. Um, or if not, I think, um, what is it that people can do if they want to support this vision for Hope Farm? How could they get behind it? Um, I would follow our progress on Facebook, Hope Farm Village. Um, and then we also have an Instagram account, Hope Farm Village. And that's kind of where we update, you know, the masses on what's going on there. And then mm -hmm. the lucasproject.org. We do have a separate fund for the residential, not the residential, sorry, the day program slash respite center um, that we are raising money through the Lucas Project for. Um, and then we have a GoFundMe account that's set up for the residential portion of it uh, because that is the LLC. So, and that's on all of those social media accounts that I just mentioned. Okay, perfect. Yes, yeah, so the, the lucasproject.org should be the, kind of the jumping off yeah. place for everything else, right? Cool. Okay. No, I, I appreciate you sharing all that. Um, I know I personally was just very curious. It's been um, inspiring to get to know you all. And just, I'm always inspired by how you say like, Hey, there's not a solution out there. I'll figure one out. <laughs> it's amazing how you always are willing to do that. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's been great working with you too. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, we will, um, post this on the, uh, the website and YouTube, make it available for everyone. Um, so, and if you have other questions, feel free to um, send them our way and we'll make sure they get answered through various social media channels and email and whatnot. All right, well, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Right, thanks a lot, bye-bye.